Blessed be our God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and he shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So shall he startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouth because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they have not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see the light, he shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 22 is found beginning on page 610 of the Book of Common Prayer. We will read this together responsibly by half verse, meaning I will read the first part of each verse by myself. And then we will join together and say the second part of each verse um, in unison. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And are, are so, so far from, from my cry and, and from, from the words of my distress. Oh my God, I cry to you in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forefathers put their trust in you. 
They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me, Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their jaws at me, like a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart within my breast is melting wax. My mouth is dried out like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And you have laid me in the dust of the grave. Packs of dogs close me in, and gangs of evildoers circle around me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far away, O Lord. You are my strength, hasten to help me. Save me from the sword, my life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, my wretched body from the horns of wild bulls. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel, all you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise nor abhor the poor in their poverty, neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deed that he has done. Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. When Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jewish authorities answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jewish authorities cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the people, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jewish authorities read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but... This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written.
when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jewish authorities did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bodies shall be none of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jewish authorities, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave his permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. to speak to you at this Good Friday service. I wish that I could see all your faces looking at back at me from your favorite pews, but I'm grateful that we've had the opportunity and space to celebrate Holy Week together. 
even if it's virtual. So I hope you've pulled up a comfy chair, at least one more comfy than our lovely wooden pews, and you're all ready to reflect on suffering. I know many of you may be tuning into the service feeling heavy. After 40 days of Lent and 365 plus days of COVID-induced fasting, it might feel harder than ever to reflect on Christ's suffering and death on the cross. Some of you may be thinking, Chloe got the short end of the stick preaching the Good Friday service, but I actually chose it, and here's why. After over a year of COVID tide, struggling with my own suffering, and struggling with the suffering of this nation, and with the suffering of my neighbors who are unemployed, mourning the death of loved ones, experiencing homelessness due to utility shutoffs and no rent, <clears throat> and dying because of racial violence, I have struggled to hear God's voice and feel God's presence. How can God be in the midst of all this? So yes, reflecting and wrestling with Christ's suffering has been a challenge, but it's also been a necessity and so I invite you, friends, to enter into this reflection with me. It may be uncomfortable, but I pray that it will be healing and help us to prepare to celebrate Christ's resurrection on Easter. <clears throat> Before I delve into our scripture passages for today, I first want to address why talking about suffering matters. Many of us have likely heard some of these common Christian responses to suffering. We have been told, your suffering has a purpose, a meaning. It is a step towards salvation and a test to bring you closer to God. We've been told, God will not give, you, give us anything that we can't handle because God is a loving God. Tell that to Job, right? Tell that to the Israelites in exile. In his book, This is the Night, James Farwell, a theologian and priest, discusses the importance of the Holy Week liturgies, including the Good Friday service. In it, he pushes back against the idea that suffering has a purpose. Suffering, he says, is the human condition. It isn't a step to redemption. It isn't meaningful. Before Christ, he says, we lived brutish lives, mean and short. Farwell also pushes back at what he describes as the myth of progress, our society's narrative around our history and the belief that everything is continually improving. In the same vein, we as modern Christians tend to skip over the suffering of Christ to talk about his resurrection. This turns Good Friday into a quick, unpleasant step on the path to glory. When we bring up suffering and injustice, we are often told to be grateful for all the advances our society has made. And in many ways, our society is better than it was 100 years ago, and even 50 years ago, within many of our lifetimes. But suffering is still all around us. And with COVID-19, it's been right at our doorstep. In addition to the virus, people are dying every day in the US because of hunger, because of inadequate health care and housing, a changing climate, and because of racial and gendered violence. The church needs to talk about this suffering. As Paul puts it in his letter to the Romans, for we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pangs of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. What does our scripture for today tell us about suffering? In both Psalm 22 and in the Gospel reading, we hear Christ echoing the psalmist's sense of God's absence when he cries out, My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? I think it's appropriate for the church to also cry out, Where is God in our present time? Where is God in all this turmoil? At this point, we're all pretty familiar with the story of Christ's crucifixion, so I want to spend some time digging into Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was likely written by King David, 
It may be a poetic reflection of David's personal suffering. I mean, the man did go through some pretty tough things in his lifetime. But I think it can also be read as a cry to God about the state of Israel and the collective suffering of his people, especially since David, as the God-chosen leader of Israel, struggled with political challenges and wars which affected the entire nation. We see this collective suffering when the speaker cries out, you are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. This feels like an accusation against God and what has felt like his absence and neglect of Israel, especially in light of God's covenant with his people. In the next stanza, the speaker returns to this covenant saying, yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. The psalmist is saying to God, you have created us, and you have created us to be your people. You have shaped us, and you cannot sit back and allow us to suffer. In some of the most haunting lines of the psalm, the speaker describes his brokenness and suffering. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Here the psalmist is saying that his body is broken, that his heart, his entire being is used up like a melted candle, that his voice is useless like a broken shard of, shard of pottery, and that God is leading him and his people to death. The speaker is saying, you have given me more than I can bear, God. God, you have not held your covenant with my ancestors and me. But about halfway through the psalm, we see the speaker turn. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. And later, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. It almost seems as though the psalmist has walked away in the middle of writing and come back a while later after a meal or a nap with a change of perspective. And while this is a possible interpretation, I think there's something a little more complex going on. In the first half of the psalm, the speaker goes back and forth, seemingly stanza by stanza, between describing his pain and holding God accountable. What really gets me is when the psalmist reminds God that he has been God's since he was first born. It feels as though the psalmist is saying that even in the midst of my suffering, my personal suffering and my people's collective suffering, I cannot and will not turn my back on you, God, because you have made me yours. Now what the psalmist couldn't have known, and what we as modern day Christians see almost immediately, are the seemingly prophetic references to Christ on the cross. Not only does Christ himself directly reference the psalm when he cries out the opening line, but in our gospel reading today, John quotes the psalm when he's recounting how Jesus' torturers divided his clothes among themselves. In the Isaiah text today, the prophet poetically describes a suffering servant, one who was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. My fellow Handel clans will also have recognized some of these quotes from Isaiah. As Handel describes Christ, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. We see an interesting reversal in Isaiah, as though we, like sheep, are gone astray. It is the good shepherd, Christ, who is sacrificed as an offering. Christ has come into the human condition, into the most brutal humiliation and suffering, bearing even the absence of God the Father while dying on the cross. Unlike us, God had, Christ had many opportunities to turn away from his suffering, but he took up his cross, and he was betrayed humiliated, tortured, and died. What does Christ's suffering mean for us? We know that becoming a part of the body of Christ does not mean that we get a pass on suffering. 
we still have to live in this broken, fallen world. We still have to die. The good news of Easter, James Farwell writes, is God's power and will to transform our lives, not after we get through suffering, but in the midst of it. This semester, I've been taking a class at the Stevenson School about racism in the church, called Repairing the Breach. One of the essays that we were assigned to read is called The Pain of Racism, written by Charles D. Fowler III, a Black Episcopalian deacon. In his essay, Fowler talks about the role of the church in societal injustice and suffering. He talks about Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy, particularly his participation and leadership with other black ministers and lay folks in the civil rights movement. Fowler recounts how Dr. King and other black ministers announced that they would lead a march to the Birmingham jail on Good Friday, and that he, Abernathy and Shuttleworth, would wear denim work clothes, the movement's sacrificial uniform. Abernathy told the reporters that Christ had died on the cross nearly 2,000 years ago, and tomorrow we will take it up for our people and die if necessary. He was talking about taking up the cross. Why has the COVID-19 pandemic been so heartbreaking? It is because we cannot turn away from the suffering at our door. In the same way Dr. King and his fellow pastors couldn't turn their back on their community suffering because it was one with their own suffering. Fowler's essay is centered around the question, do we feel the pain of others? I want to add to the question, do we feel the pain not just of others, but of those who have been othered? What's so striking about Christ's death on the cross is the love and compassion that it embodies. We have all been through times where we suffered out of love for another, whether it be a sick friend or a dying family member. But how often do we feel the pain of another who is not our family or friend? How often do we hold collective suffering? For those that have read the news at all the last year, you know how easy it is to get instantly overwhelmed with all the pain that people are experiencing. But as the Catholic activist and nun Dorothy Bain wisely said, I really only love God as much as I love the person I love the least. I want to close with a reflection on Julian of Norwich, a 14th century mystic, theologian, and English saint who survived the bubonic plague, a plague that historians estimate killed off anywhere from a third to half of Europe's population at the time. Julian's own family and most of her community were victims of this horrible disease, a tragedy that we can only begin to imagine. Throughout her ministry, she wrestled with suffering, both her own and those of the people she ministered to. But along with other mystics in her time, she found incredible comfort in Christ's suffering and sought to ache for what Christ ached for, his people and his world. In the midst of Christ's suffering and her own suffering, she wrote, all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. This, my friends, is the Good Friday promise that Christ's suffering for us has redeemed our own suffering. As the body of Christ, we are joined with him as he suffers through us and within us for the world. My friends, wherever you may be today, whatever cross you might bear, know this. In Christ, you are not alone. And although we do not know all ends, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
dear people of God. Our Heavenly Father has sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might be delivered from the power of sin and death, and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere, according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Audrey, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for all those about to be baptized, that God will confirm his, faith, his church in faith increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them. For Joe Biden, the President of the United States. For the Congress and the Supreme Court. For the members and representatives of the United Nations. For all who serve the common good that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair. For the sorrowful and bereaved. For prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger. That God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, 
creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls. Have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. We glory in your cross, O Lord, and praise and glorify your holy resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving help among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We glory in your cross, O Lord and praise and glorify your resurrection. For by virtue of your cross, joy has come to the whole world. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. If we have died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we, sh we shall also reign with him. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. O Savior of the world, who by thy cross and precious blood hast redeemed us, save us and help us, we humbly beseech thee, O Lord. Let us pray together in the words our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead. To your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 